Last week, we made the case for British forces staying on alone in Afghanistan. It followed comments from two former defence ministers, Johnny Mercer and Tobias Elwood, that the UK should stay and fight the Taliban, even though the Americans have left. That story took a fresh twist today, with the Defence Secretary reportedly saying that Britain had seriously considered a unilateral presence in Afghanistan, not just thought about it, but tried to win NATO allies over to what would have been a British-led mission. Well, Colonel Richard Kemp, we've already introduced him once, but we'll try again. He's a former commander of British forces in Afghanistan. He joins us now. Uh, Richard, thanks so much for your time. appreciate it. Um, uh, ben Wallace, very candid. Uh, perhaps he didn't realise his comments were going to be written up in the way they were, but very candid about saying that Britain would have stayed in Afghanistan, um, even with America withdrawing, if we could have only cobbled together some sort of NATO coalition. I think I think that would have been uh, a good thing to do, to be honest. I think it wouldn't have been that, that easy because it's always hard to get other countries to join an effort like that. And indeed, our armed forces now are extremely small. But I think it could have been done potentially. And I think it would have been the right thing to do. I think we, you know, we, I, th I believe the American withdrawal was the wrong thing to do. And of course, if we couldn't form another coalition ourselves, we had no choice other than to leave and, let, and effectively betray the Afghan people and betray those soldiers and other members of the armed forces who have um, made so many sacrifices in Afghanistan. Uh, are you one of those people, Richard, who thinks that we may need to go back in, uh, at a later date, go back into Afghanistan? And that being the case, it will, it, it's, a, 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 it's a type of madness, isn't it? Because it's so much harder to fight your way into somewhere than it is to hold territory and defend it. Absolutely right it is. And, and I, I'm one of those people who think we may have to go in, but I'm one of those people who think we will never go back in because I don't think any government has got the guts to do it. E even a government that's now may have been considering, I, I don't know whether they really were or not, may have been considering staying on with a British-led coalition. But I certainly don't think a British, any British government's going to go back into a situation like Afghanistan and Iraq. They've been too terrified by their experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq before. I think they're deliberately trying to keep out of any ground conflict that's going to result in the deaths of British people. So I think we will put up with almost anything now to avoid returning to Afghanistan. And I think, you know, you just have to think what happened in 2012, 2011, 2012, when all forces withdrew from Iraq um, under President Obama uh, in order to win, hope, in his hopes to win the uh, US election. And, and that resulted directly in the rise of the Islamic State. So I think we're going to see something equally catastrophic now, potentially, in Afghanistan, possibly even worse than the rise of the Islamic State. But I very much doubt we're going to go in on the ground and fix it. Yeah. I mean, is there an argument for, for something a bit more light touch in the sense that you could maybe have forward air controllers working cheek by jowl with the Afghan army calling in allied air power that uses that advantage we've obviously got out there, which is, you know, that the, the skies are only filled with allied aircraft, and they could, if the Taliban are advancing on the move, they're exposed, they're not dug in. It is an opportunity to actually kill quite a lot of them. I absolutely agree. I think, I think air force, um, airplanes, air controllers, special forces, small agile units um, that are able to hit hard and then, and then pull away rather than get involved in endless grinding patrols on the ground. Mm. Uh, which caused so many casualties and did so little, had so little benefit, really. Um, I think that's the way that, that it should have gone, but it isn't going to go that way now. There might, there might be, I think the Americans might be leaving behind some air capability and some special force capability. We might do the same, uh, but it probably won't be, it probably won't be enough to, uh, to turn the tides, I think, now. And the major problem, I think, now is that it's not so much withdrawal of capability, um, that, that obviously does have an effect on the campaign. It's more, I think, the morale effect it has on the Afghan soldiers. The fact that their backstop, their guarantors are pulling out. And you can imagine what that feels like if you're a soldier fighting for his life. Um, you know, and they're, they're fighting very tough battles and they're brave men, the Afghan soldiers. Most of the ones I've met certainly were. And they're, they're um, you know, they're, 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 their friends and allies are deserting them. And, and that has, in the past, that kind of situation has led directly to collapse. We spent so many years talking about things like, you know, the Sandhurst of Afghanistan, the way we were mentoring and helping train uh, uh, these new cadres of Afghan, uh, an Afghan officer class and, and the people that serve beneath them as well. Um, how much confidence do we have that that has 
created a, a, a culture where they will stay the course. I mean, presumably the, the Russians tried that sort of thing as well. I mean, if they don't want to fight, then this is a country riven by this patchwork of different ethnicities and clans and people to some degree, inevitably, for all they've, we've tried to join them up and stitch them up into some sort of pan-Afghan force. When push comes to shove, there might be a, a, pre, a previous and stronger allegiance to a, to a tribe or a clan or an ethnicity. Absolutely. I was involved in in training of Afghan security forces in the early days back in 2003, and a huge amount more has been done since then in, in terms of the time and effort invested in training, the finances involved, the provision of weapons and equipment. All of that's been done. And as I said, I think they're very brave men, a lot of them. And I think, uh, you know, they, they, could, they could have the ability to hold back the Taliban, but the problem is that they don't believe in their government. The government is corrupt. The government doesn't pay them half the time. It doesn't look after them. Um, they don't really have, in many cases, don't have any real identification with a country called Afghanistan. They are, as you said, tribal people on the whole. Um, and so when the chips, if the government's not treating them well, when the chips are down, when the, li when the likelihood is you're going to die, are you going to fight to the death for something you don't really believe in? I think that's what we're seeing, and we've seen a lot. Now, I hope I'm not right, and I hope that, that those who are able to, to stand up, and there are plenty of, you know, particularly some of the special forces out there who are even a cut above the others, um, I, I hope they're able to make a difference and, and, and win it over. But the government, I think, you know, the government is pretty much a disgrace um, and, and isn't doing much to help itself, in my opinion. We talked to Malcolm Rifkin, Sir Malcolm Rifkin, the former defence, former foreign secretary last week, and we both talked about a book written, I think, in the early 1990s called The Great Game. I wonder if you've read it. I suspect you may have done by Peter Hopkirk. It makes the point that Afghanistan has so long been this sort of crossroads and intersection and different hyperpowers have sought um, to be in charge there and supremacy there. Part of the problem of what's happening here, it seems to me, is that the message that's been sent out by the West is that we won't back you in the long term. Uh, maybe you want to think about other countries that will. And if you are, in the old jargon of the Cold War, a client state looking for a backer, uh, you might be better advised to choose China, Russia, if you're Afghanistan, Pakistan. That's the problem. And, and the message that's being sent by the West, particularly America now, to the world is exactly that, that, you know, don't, don't stick with us because we're not going to stick with you. Go for somebody else. Go for someone you can rely on. And, and, and that is a global problem, I think, that will undermine U.S. strength over the coming years. Um, but it's also the case within Afghanistan. I mean, the vultures are circling. You've got Pakistan, as you mentioned, who have been mainly behind giving the Taliban the power they've got today. They've used the Taliban in order to get control of Afghanistan, which they intend to have when the Taliban take over, if the Taliban take over. Um, you've got uh, China also circling like vultures, desperate for resources from Afghanistan, already in contact and supporting the Taliban, hedging their bets with both sides of the government. Same with Iran, playing with, Afghan with the Afghan government and also funding and resourcing the Taliban. And Russia in a similar position, also supporting the Taliban. Uh, and so when, 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 if, if the Taliban take over, those vultures will have a lot of um, influence and, and potentially power in Afghanistan, which they will use for their own advantage and also di directly against the West. And when, if and when Afghanistan again becomes a safe haven for terrorists, which it will if the Taliban take over, then those countries will, will have a way of using that safe haven against the West indirectly, in and they will, they will have proxies there. And it, it will be it will turn out to be, I think, a, a devastating mess. And that's without even mentioning, for example, the, the massive uh, refugee problem that's going to arise. Yeah. Afghans are already the second largest refugee popula population in the world. They're about to become even even greater because well, many will go to Pakistan, as they already are. Yeah. Others will go to Iran, to Turkey and indeed to Europe. Yeah. I've been to uh, one of those refugee camps in, in Pakistan. I think there's like two million Afghans still living in Pakistan. But you're right. I think that's the story that's coming. Afghans moving westwards. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.